a lot of fun to watch and a great opportunity to invite people to come uh, see the children, but to hear the gospel message and hear the true Christmas story. And so I hope you'll be praying about that. Pray for them as they're practicing that they'll uh, learn and do their very best, but that we can have people here and be able to present uh, the gospel to them when they have their program. And so be praying about that now. Think now about people that you might be able to invite to come and be a part of that. And we just look forward to having that opportunity here uh, at our church. I um, also want to remind our men about our final men's fellowship that we'll have this calendar year, uh, this coming Saturday at 8.30. Uh, we'll get together and we'll have a, a breakfast again and have spend some time in God's Word. We just want to encourage all of our men that are here to come and be a part of that. And uh, we always have a great time and we want to encourage you to be be here for that. Don't forget about uh, Thanksgiving week. We'll have our service on Tuesday of that week instead of Wednesday. That's what we normally do on Thanksgiving week. So make sure you don't forget about that and miss uh, miss that service at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. We won't have Patch or a youth uh, group on that night. We'll all be in the service here together. And so we'll just have one uh, meeting here together. And so we just want to remind you about that as well. Uh, uh, don't forget about all of our Christmas activities we'll have going on now or on Saturday the 7th we'll have of December. We'll have our Christmas dinner, and it's always a fun time of fellowship. And the ladies are having a Christmas fellowship on Monday, December the 2nd. And so I hope you'll uh, remember those things and mark them down and be aware of them. Our King's Court basketball program starts as well uh, in December. And again, just another opportunity to, to minister to families uh, that we may not otherwise be able to uh, be able to reach and so we look forward to that and then don't forget as well that note in the bulletin uh, we have special expenses in November that are not normal monthly expenses and if you would uh, like to give uh, towards those things as a special offering to help us with that uh, that'd be a blessing for our church and help us just to uh, keep everything taken care of and so we uh, want to remind you about that and be praying about that as well but this time we'll ask our men to come we'll take up our tithes offering and faith promise this evening Let's pray together. Amen. On Sunday nights, we always take up a change offering, and we're going to do that again tonight as well. Uh, so Jordan's going to come and help me get that jug out and be ready to go. Uh, I do want to say uh, <clears throat> that tomorrow is Veterans Day, and so boy, I hope that you'll do something to show the veterans appreciation and how much we are thankful and, uh, and what we are indebted to them for, and uh, I'm thankful for all that are in our services and in our church. Hey. And uh, we are thankful for all of you who served our country. And we want to let you know how much we appreciate that. And uh, we want to be a blessing uh, to you. Thank the Lord for you. Appreciate that and uh, what you mean to us. Uh, these, uh, some of these uh, boys and girls in here are veterans of taking up the change offering. They used to do that when they were in elementary school. And when I first came, there are some of these now that... that used to be taking up the change offering. Then they got too old because they became teenagers, and then they became college students. So, boy, they're moving right on up and out. But all of you high school teenage youth group kids, I need you to come and help me. you got to carry the load. Remember, this is for camp, and at least a couple weeks out of every year, I get you guys to come and help me. And uh, church camp is, is great, and the teenagers always enjoy it. 
and uh, they have a great time, so they got to earn their keep a little bit here for the next couple weeks anyway. But we appreciate them, and uh, we've got a great bunch of young people. Uh, our youth group right now is really exciting. There'll be 25 kids over there or so on Wednesday night, and there are a lot of younger kids, you know, that are just now getting in, and boy, they like everything. You know, they, 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 they like to sing, they like to eat, they like to play games, they, they like everything. It's amazing. And then something will happen and in a year or two they won't like anything. You know, they, they won't want to do anything. But right now they're really good. And so we're excited about that and, and the Lord's at work there in some of those lives. You know, there's some, there's some young people there that you can just see that God's at work in their life. They've got, they, they're just something different, and God's going to use them. And so we're praying for them, and we're thankful for that. But uh, we always take up our change offering, and uh, we just want to do that again tonight and uh, just be laying aside what we need to uh, so that we'll be ready next summer when it comes camp time. So if you have some change and something like that you'd like to give in the offering tonight, go ahead and do that. Just try to picture them like they used to be, about like this and uh, you'll do better. But let's pray, and uh, we'll receive the offering. Father, we are thankful for your love for us. Thank you for uh, your grace and for what you were willing to do for us. Thank you for men and women who have been willing to, Lord, defend our nation in times of uh, oppression and give us the liberty we have today to be able to serve you and to worship you. Help us, God, to show how much that means to us by taking full advantage, God, of living a Christian life. And Lord, we just pray that you'll bless the offering tonight. Just uh, take these young lives, these teenagers. Lord, I pray each of them will just put their life in your hand and Lord, be used of you. And uh, Lord, just really realize what a joy it is to live for you and save you, uh, to, to be saved and to serve their Savior. Pray, Father, that they'll look to you for every step of their life, God, as they, as they move into school and then out of school and into the next step of their life. I pray they'll seek your will every step of the way. And Lord, you'll lead and guide and use them. And we'll thank you for it. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you do have some offering, just hold your hand up and uh, they're going to come by and pick that up. Amen. Well, thank you for helping us with that. Before Pastor comes tonight, Brother Rogers is going to come and lead us in a chorus before Pastor comes. Here's your opportunity to be the special singing. Let's, uh, let's sing uh, number 135. Let's go through that a couple of times. 135. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. He was crucified for me. He died on Calvary. Let's sing it again. Christ is all I need. Christ is all. Good to see everyone tonight. Good to have Josh feeling like being here this evening. And we do want you to pray for him. And 
believe the Lord's going to take care of everything, but we just want to pray for him, lift him up for the Lord and uh, all the other folks that we have that are under the weather and out of, not able to be in our services and uh, because it's coming for all of us someday, you know, and so we're thankful for the opportunities we can to be here. Uh, I do hope you'll just uh, uh, be as excited as we are about the children and their rehearsing and practicing, getting ready for their Christmas program. That's always a blessing. And uh, so we look forward to that. Let's take our Bibles tonight for a moment or two and turn to the uh, Old Testament book of Proverbs, Proverbs the 11th chapter. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture there, Proverbs 11 and uh, verse number 30. Proverbs 11 and verse 30. We're going to preach tonight on this subject, the greatest honor in all the world. The greatest honor in all the world. Proverbs 11 and verse number 30. The Bible says, The fruit of the righteous is as a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. Let's pray together. Father, as we open our Bibles, we want to open up our heart to the Word of God. Uh, Lord, I pray today that, God, you would speak to my heart, the hearts of all of our people, that, God, we might be a local church with a heart, God, that desires to be used of you to reach souls. Lord, day in and day out, wherever we may be, may we be conscious of lost souls. God, may we Try to influence them through our lives, God, as we stay in tune with you, as we live, Lord, in tune with you. May our life impact their life. Lord, may we seek God to uh, guide them and lead them as we distribute, Lord, gospel literature, a gospel track or a gospel booklet, something we can do, uh, God, so that we know that we're bringing your word into their pathway. And, uh, Lord, the lost are on the pathway that leads them away from you. Help us, God, to intervene and, Lord, to put your word in the way. I pray, Father, you'd help each of us, Lord, families reaching families and folks reaching other folks, being praying every day for lost people. Uh, Lord, be seeking for opportunities to invite them to church. Lord, may there not be a week go by where we're not working each service to have someone as our guest in church. God, help us, Lord, to have a revival of New Testament Christianity. And God, may we not be content just to simply come to church, but Lord, may we seek, God, that through our local church we can win souls. Well, we pray you'd help us today as we look at these things. Maybe somebody's come to church tonight, Lord, and you're speaking to their heart. They know in their heart they haven't been born again. They need to be saved. We pray today in this acceptable day, this time now that's acceptable, they'll trust you. And Lord, we pray you'd just deal with our hearts. May we be obedient to you and be used by you. We pray it all tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, with the holidays coming up now, we've got Thanksgiving and then following right along is Christmas and New Year's. We, uh, we may have, many of us may have, the opportunity to be with family member. Uh, family members that we love but just aren't ready to meet the Lord. They're not saved. I wonder tonight, how many of you would say that would be my case when I get together with my family? There'll be some people there that I don't know that are ready to meet the Lord. I think that would be probably true of most of our families. I want to pray for you about them. I want to pray for you about them. But I want to pray for you that you would let God use you some way, somehow, to help them come to know Christ as their Savior. We've looked recently at God's Word at the greatest work in all the world. We said that the greatest work in all the world is not balancing the budget. It's not uh, trying to house the homeless or feed the hungry. It is, though, compassionately, it is humbly and urgently trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost world. That's the greatest work in all the world. We, uh, we've seen that the greatest work in the world is done by the greatest people in the world and that they're not presidents and they're not uh, princes or po political leaders or powerful businessmen. 
But there are people just like you and I who know the Lord is our Savior and uh, who live every day on purpose to try to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. This great work is the greatest battle in all the world. We looked at that last week. It's the greatest battle in the world. We said the Bible teaches us there are many adversaries to this work. Among those are Satan. Satan uh, wants to send as many people to hell as he can because he's going there himself. And uh, he doesn't want anybody else to know the grace and goodness and mercy of God and forgiveness. He hates God and wants to do everything he can uh, to, uh, to nullify or to minimize the impact of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the lives of other men and women. Satan is our adversary. Sinners sometimes are their own adversaries. Many times they're not ready. They want to wait. They hesitate. Uh, they, uh, they're deceived in darkness. They need to be brought into the light. Satan's hid the gospel from their eyes. And sometimes they're their own worst enemies. Our self for most of us, is our greatest adversary. Ourself, through indifference, through indulging our flesh, and through uh, the other uh, things that, uh, that our flesh does, it sets itself in opposition to simply obediently being a witness of Jesus Christ. And even, even among the saints, there are going to always be others among the church professing Christ who set themselves in opposition to the work of God moving forward, and they may not even be aware of it in their own lives. We've looked at these things, but I want to say to you tonight that there is, however, no greater honor in all the world that a man can experience in this life than to be used of God to lead a soul to Jesus Christ. No greater honor in all the world. D.L. Moody and everybody, I'm going to mention the names of a lot of great men of God from the past. You ought to mark them down. If you don't know anything about them, you ought to read about these men. These men will impact and change your life. The Bible speaks about those being dead yet speaketh. These are some of those kind of men. D.L. Moody, the great founder of the Moody Bible Institute, Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, made this statement, there's no greater honor than to be an instrument in God's hands to be used to lead a soul out of darkness and in the light. The word honor, if we defined it with the dictionary definition, means of high worth and notable merit. There isn't anything in the world as honorable as leading a soul to Christ and the Savior. Think of it. Think about a soul. Think about the, think about the, the eternity of a soul. Every soul will exist as long as God does. God created them. God is eternal. God created those souls eternally. They will exist as long now as God does. Some in heaven safe and alive. Some in hell perishing, dying, forever separated from Him. But think about the eternity of souls. Think about sin and its reality. We see it all around us. The reality of sin is everywhere. This world has uh, been set apart for destruction because of sin. That's corrupted it. The lives of men and women. We're born sinners, conceived in sin. We're sinners by conception sinners by choice, sinners by our own conscience and conviction, and sin is a reality that all men must face, and sin will send souls to hell forever without Jesus Christ. Think about, think about though, the, the possibility in the salvation that Christ has provided. All men, women, boys, and girls, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a great possibility there is for souls because of Jesus Christ. And there's no greater honor than reaching them with the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. The word ambassador means ranking in an honorable position. I want you to know that if you're saved today, there's no more honorable position on planet earth then you that know Christ that you have right now. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are an ambassador for God. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said some men's ambitions are gold, fame, or art. My ambition is the souls of men. Uh, R.A. Torrey said, I would rather win souls than to be the greatest king or emperor on planet earth. And I want to encourage you tonight to get in the battle and experience the greatest honor in the world, being instrumental in leading a soul to Jesus Christ. 
Uh, I want to give you these things quickly. Number one, when you think about this great honor of being involved in the greatest work and the greatest battle in all the world, there's the honor, first of all, in being involved in something that reproduces really the life of Christ. It's a reproducing work. Think about the honor of that. You know, most of, most of us can remember a year maybe when <clears throat> unusually cold weather, maybe heavy frost, uh, hit the, the state of Florida. And maybe, maybe the weather, uh, because it was wrong, the patterns of weather were wrong, those blossoms sat on all of those fruit trees and all of those orchards, but those blossoms froze. And instead of setting fruit, they just fell off, left those trees barren and fruitless. Orchards filled with barren and fruitless trees. Anita Bryant had nothing to talk about. No orange juice. You remember her doing the orange juice commercial? Talk, we're now we're talking about how old we are, aren't we? <clears throat> but that happens all across, you know, all across our nation. Though tonight, there are local churches filled with barren and fruitless lives of people who profess to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, but have never been involved in the honorable work of winning souls to Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter one, verse three, the Bible says. And he, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit. You ought to circle the word his, his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I believe in, uh, that within each one of us who know Christ as our Savior is the potential to bear fruit and win souls for Christ. It's within every one of us. It's not in us because of who we are. It's in us because Christ lives in us. He said in Acts 1.8, I will give you the, the Holy Spirit. He'll come. And when He comes, uh, you shall be witnesses unto me. And so if we know Christ as our Savior, we possess the potential to reach souls for Jesus Christ. He lives within us. The question is, are we letting him live through us in Psalm 126 verse 6 the Bible said he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him the Bible says if you and I would wake up and walk forth into the fields of harvest and begin to weep for the souls that are there as the Savior did, if we'll wet the hearts of lost men uh, with uh, tears and time spent at God's throne in prayer, if we'll send the Word forth and sow the seed of God's Word, uh, we will return bringing our sheaves with Him. That's a promise God has made to us. A sheave or sheaves is in reference, at least mathematically, to more than one. It means a bundle of. It means an abundance of. It means more than just a few. And we believe today that within our lives, in Christ, is the potential for each of us to bring a bundle of souls for the glory of God to Him. Uh, John chapter 4, verse number 35. You remember back in the Gospel of John as the Lord is there speaking to His disciples. He encourages them in the 35th verse of John 4. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Uh, you know, tonight, uh, I want to ask you, will you be rejoicing someday in heaven with the fruit God used you to reap? Will you be rejoicing with the fruit God used you to reap? You know, any fruit you pick and produce in this world that's of the world will someday perish with the world, but not the fruit of souls. That's an eternal, eternal fruit. Yeah. It will exist forever and forever. John 15, 8, Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Are we following our Savior in reaping and harvesting fruit? Verse 16 said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You know, there's a, there's a sense of accomplishment in a job completed, in a task 
that is followed through. There's something about that that gives us a sense of accomplishment. But there's nothing like leading a soul to Jesus Christ. It might be in a vacation Bible school. Some little boy or girl, and you don't think they've been listening to a thing all week, and you've been trying to do everything you can except nail them down to the floor to get them to listen. And then finally it breaks through in their heart and life, and they, they come and they, they tug on your, on your shirt tail, and they say, you know, I want to know what it means to be saved. And to be able to sit down and lead them to Jesus Christ. Nothing, no greater honor in all the world that you could achieve. It might, be, it might be a teenager at a church camp. I can remember sitting down on the back row of an open-air tabernacle with Doug, who's not here tonight, but he's been uh, out in a meeting, preaching in a meeting this weekend, uh, sitting down with Doug on the back pew of an open tabernacle halfway through a week at church camp and him, uh, his heart under conviction, just wanting to be sure his life was right with God be able to help him settle the question of his eternal salvation. You know, it could be a man or a woman in some apartment building somewhere. In Tennessee, we were out visiting on a Thursday night, and I was out with Brother, uh, <coughs> brother Ken Howe's brother, or son-in-law, Rick Rose. We were over in Model City Apartments. If you ever drive down uh, Interstate 23 and you go through Kingsport, uh, before you cross that bridge where on both sides there are baseball fields. Some of you know exactly where that's at. You start going up the other side and you're almost out to Interstate 81. On the left, there's apartment buildings that stair-step their way right down the highway. Model city apartments. I don't know how many hundreds of, of apartments there are in there. We had a bus route that we ran in there that averaged at least 80 on one bus every single Sunday. And some days they'd have over 100 on one bus. And we were in there visiting one night, and we went in an apartment, went upstairs, Rick and I, we knocked on the door, and a young man in his early 20s opened the door. His name was Matt. He let us in. We began to witness to him and share the gospel. We found out he's originally from Ohio, but he had moved down there for work, and he was looking for work, and he had moved down there. His girlfriend's father actually lived in that apartment, and they all were living there together. And so we caught Matt at home. We sat down and shared the gospel with Matt. And as we sat there on his couch, he bowed his head and prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. As soon as he did that, the front door of the apartment opened in and Sonia's girlfriend came in. And we told her who we were and what Matt had just done. And Matt told her what he had just done. And just in a few minutes, we had led Sonia to the Lord. I was thankful we got to see him get into church and, and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And maybe some of you years ago met Matt at one of the prayer retreats. We brought him several times with us to the prayer retreats. There's no greater honor in all the world than to be able to do that. Maybe, maybe it might be in a parking lot. I can remember down in Churchill, Tennessee, out visiting in bus visitation one Saturday morning, and we went in a trailer park, and it was just a gravel driveway that made a circle with trailers all around that trailer park. And we'd been visiting on one side, working our way around, and I saw two, neat, two teenage girls come out of a trailer and walk out and get into their car and start to drive away. And I stopped them as they drove by, and I told them that I, who, my, who I was, what my name was. I hadn't been down there very long. I said, you know what? My family and I have left all the family we know up in Ohio and we've moved down here where we don't know anybody but we've came here because the Lord has sent us to tell people that Christ loves them that you can trust him and be saved. We gave them a gospel track and I knelt down in the gravels and shared the gospel with them and there in their car they both prayed to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. There's no greater honor than all that in all the world. No greater honor than that. It might be a family in their living room. Not uh, not long ago, there's a family right over here in, in South Point in their home. They just built a brand new home and didn't have any furniture in it. And I was visiting one day, just knocking through, knocking on doors, and a man opened the door, and I introduced myself, and he let me come in, and boy, they were proud of their new house. And we went in the living room, and I said, Sir, have you ever received Christ as your Savior? If you died today, uh, do you know you've been born again? And he said, No. He said, I don't. And he began to cry. He said, I'd like to know that. And he got his wife in, and he got his 10-year-old daughter to come in. And in the middle of that beautiful, empty living room, we sat down in the floor, and I got to share the gospel with them. And all three of them received Jesus Christ as their Savior. No greater honor than that in all the world. I want you to know today that there's the great honor of being 
and being able to be a part of Christ reproducing His life in the lives of other people. No greater honor in all the world. And that's what God has ordained for every one of us that knows Christ. And every one of us has Christ within us who can use our lives if we'll allow Him to. I want you to think about this. There's not the honor of reproducing Christ in other lives. There's the honor of rescuing souls. If you look in Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 30, it says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. You can mark the word winneth in your Bible. The word winneth here means to seize, to capture, to lay hold on, to catch. That's what this word means. In Luke 5.10, And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. It's the same word, winneth. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 25. A true witness delivereth souls. It's the same word. It's the word winneth. 1 Corinthians 1, verse, chapter 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Save them. James chapter 5 and verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Jude 22 and 23. And of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Have you ever rescued someone physically? Ever, ever been in directly involved in saving their life? My little petite wife has done that. This is an interesting story. We were at a birthday party for some friends of ours who attended the church, uh, Brother Sturgill's church, Ethan's church in Tabernacle, and I was on staff there. They had a little girl about three years age, of age or so. They had other kids that were a little older, and one of them was about Lydia's age. So our families had kind of connected. We were trying to incorporate them more and more into the church ministry. So they had a birthday party in the real nice area of Kingsport, her father's house. He had a big in-the-ground pool in the backyard. So he was throwing a big party, and there was just kids running around everywhere and all kinds of things going on. And we're all out back around the pool. And my wife standing there, it's a Saturday afternoon. We'd gone to bus visitation. She looked nice, as she always did, and had on some type of blouse and a nice skirt and looked nice. And she's standing there holding an iced tea in her hand right by the pool. And, you know, we didn't really notice anything, but my wife did, and she looked down, and there was that little girl in the bottom of the swimming pool, three years old. My wife kept the tea in one hand, jumped in the pool, held the tea up, reached under, grabbed the kid, got her over, put her on the side of the pool, and got out without spilling a drop. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, you know, it's amazing. Don't, uh, you know, I hear people all the time talk about how, Pastor, we can't do this, that, in a dress. We can't do this and that in a skirt. Hey, you can save a life in a skirt. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, but uh, the little girl was okay, thankfully. But, but, you know, what a thrill to be able to be involved and being able to do that. And, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to have that sense of, uh, of accomplishment, fulfillment. But, but to win a soul is to reach down into and pull out of the flames and the fire of hell and torment and deliver that soul forever and ever out of that place. There isn't anything in the world any more honorable or greater than that. God's heart tonight is burdened for souls. He has done His work, sent His Son who died and was buried and rose again. And He can and will save all who know about Him and call upon His name. But we have to seek them out and rescue them. We have to go and win them. Never forget the value of a soul and the potential that's in one soul for the glory of God if we can just reach one. There's the honor of reproducing. There's the honor of rescuing. But then thirdly, there's the honor. This honor will be rewarded. Proverbs 11, verse 30, He that winneth souls is wise. The word wise here means to be skillful and knowledgeable and recognized as such. That's what this word means, this wise word. You know, I enjoy standing back and looking at what I've done sometimes if I actually get something together right. Maybe you, maybe you have built something or 
fix something or you ladies may have made something, uh, something for your house, uh, some piece of clothing or whatever it might be. You know, you enjoy looking back at that and saying, you know, with my own two hands, I built this or did that or made that. You know, uh, seeking to win souls, though, is the most rewarding work in all the world. Be wise. That's what this message is about. Be wise. Choose to seek souls. Make the choice that we want to be involved in the most rewarding and honorable thing in all the world. Uh, Pastor Strogel used to say over and over again, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Over and over and over again you say that. You know, life is like money in the sense that there's only really two things you can do with it. Spend it or invest it. That's all you can do with your life. You can take your life and just go spend it up every day. And all you'll get is the face value of it for that day. And you'll spend it and it'll be gone. Or you can invest it. You can invest your life in the things of God. And if you invest your life in the work of God, in the things of God, you're not only going to get back more than you gave, but you're going to get it back for a longer time. Because the things of God are eternal things. Don't lay up treasure in this world. Lay it up in heaven. And there it will be forever and forever. Robert Murray McShane, I told you this morning, he said one of the secrets of life is this. Live your life so that you will be missed by someone when you're gone. I want to ask you, will anyone miss you when you're gone? Anyone, someone who owes their eternal soul to what you were willing to do for them? Luke chapter 22 and verse 27 says, For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? Jesus said, But I am among you as he that serveth. Here the word serveth is from the word servant. This word servant means someone who, who's willing to pour their life into someone else. That's all they exist to do. To pour their life into someone else's life. In Romans 10 verse 15 it says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Philippians 3, 7, Paul looked at all of his life and all that he was and all that he had and who he was before he knew Jesus Christ. And he said in the seventh verse of chapter 3, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss when I compared them with Jesus Christ. He said, I could have held on to everything I was and everything I had and boasted and rested in what I'd accomplished, but if I had done that, I would have been the loser if I would have traded those for Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 16, the Bible says there that we're to awake and we must redeem the time because the days are evil. Luke chapter 15 and verse 10 says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now I'm going to be the first to admit to you, I don't know everything that that verse means. I like to think about it. I like to try to use my inspired imagination to try to think about all those kind of things, you know. Think about that. There'll be, there'll be joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. I don't know all that means, but I do know that it means when a sinner is saved and their name is written down in the Lamb's book of life, that there's rejoicing in heaven. I don't know how that works. You know, I like to think this. I would like to think that there's some little mother up there that, uh, that left this world not knowing her, her son got saved or was saved. And boy, when that boy comes to Christ and his name's written down, somebody's dispatched into heaven there to find that little woman and say, oh, guess what? Your boy just received Jesus. We just wrote his name down. I don't know how it's going to be. That just might be my imagination. I like to think about how they'll be shouting and rejoicing in Hallelujah Square. I told you how Jim Kern, such an encourager, would sing that song. He would push himself up shakily and put his hand out. He couldn't bend his fingers over the cane. He had to hold them straight. But he would push himself up and lock his knees, step out in the aisle of that big church, and he would sing Hallelujah Square. Maybe you don't know the words to that, but the first two verses go like this. I saw a blind man tapping along, losing his way as he passed through the throng. 
Tears filled my eyes. I said, friend, you can't see. But with a smile on his face, he replied to me, I'll see all my friends in Hallelujah Square. What a wonderful time we'll all have up there. We'll sing and praise Jesus, His glory to share, and you'll not see one blind man in Hallelujah Square. The second verse, I think, is the verse Jim liked to sing. He said, Now I saw a cripple dragging his feet. He couldn't walk like we do down the street. I said, My friend, I feel sorry for you. But he said, Up in heaven, I'm going to walk just like you. And he would sing, I'll see all my friends in Hallelujah Square. What a wonderful time we'll all have up there. We'll sing and praise Jesus, His glory to share. And you'll not see one cripple in Hallelujah Square. That's real, isn't it? That's a real thought. They ring the bells of heaven when a sinner gets saved. In the angel's presence. Did you you catch that? How there'll be joy in the angel's presence. I've tried to study that a little bit. And, you know, the angels don't understand what it means to be saved. Those that left their first estate, those who followed Satan in rebellion, they are forever set aside for eternal torment and punishment. Some are already bound in chains in the bottomless pit. Others are going to to be able to roam free, but there'll be a day when they're all cast into the lake of fire with the devil who all led them away from God. And not to one of them has ever been offered the opportunity to repent and to be saved. Not one. They don't know anything about salvation. In their presence in heaven, people rejoice when a soul is saved. The Bible speaks about how in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 12, they say of salvation, of which things the angels desire to look into. They're curious about it. They wonder about it. But they see the effect that it has in heaven, how there's rejoicing there. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, the Bible says in the 11th verse, 1 Corinthians eleven three. you know, if you're saved, we, we must not forget We must not forget this. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We have to build our life on that foundation. And there's so many people that don't know Him. But it goes on to say in the 12th verse, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For all Uh, For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. He shall receive a reward. If any man's work abide, if any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. You know, winning souls and serving God, it counts right now, right here, when we win a soul. It counts. Yeah. Think of what it does for that individual. But someday it means you will be crowned over there when the battle's over. It counts now, but there'll be a day when you will be crowned because you chose to win souls. You know, I don't have time to speak about the five crowns that a child of God can win. You can live and labor in this world, and someday when you meet Jesus Christ and stand before Him, there are five different crowns that He can give to you, can present to you, can reward you with for your faithful service unto Him. But I do want to just mention this one. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 19, the Bible says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing. What is our crown of rejoicing? Paul says, he says, Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? He said, our crown of rejoicing is going to, going to fill, be filled with the jewels of all the souls that are going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ when Christ comes again. That's what's going to be the jewels on the crown of rejoicing. Paul, Paul's asking the question. He says, you know, uh, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? You know, I hope you'll try to see it in your imagination. There'll be a day when, <clears throat> when we'll go and we'll stand before the Lord Jesus. There'll be a day when our works are made manifest and He'll try them. 
And if they were of the world and for men and for the flesh and for ourselves and for the world, they're going to all be destroyed. There will be nothing left. There will be so many who have lived for nothing. Their life will have not made a difference in the world. But there'll be some whose life does make a difference. There'll be some who chose to get in the battle and get involved in the greatest work in all the world and they will have pointed souls to Jesus Christ. Oh, they may not even know of all the souls that are there because that they chose to try to influence others for Jesus. But there'll be a day when the Lord will bring us one by one before Him. And I don't know again how this might work, but man, wouldn't it be something if, if, if there would suddenly come stepping up behind you and encircling you at the judgment seat of Christ, people there that maybe you recognize, but others maybe you didn't, and the Lord Jesus might say, do you see all of them standing here? Do you recognize them? Do you know who they are? You were wise in your lifetime. You were wise and you won them to me, some you don't even know about. And here's the crown of rejoicing that you've won because of the life that you lived and the choices that you made. What a great thought to think about that. I don't know how it's all going to work out, but the Bible tells us there's a crown of rejoicing to be won. That's the soul winner's crown for pointing souls to Jesus. But the greatest thought of all of that is in Revelation chapter 4 where the Bible says in the 10th verse, And the four and twenty elders fell down before Him, that sat on the throne and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. I don't believe in heaven we'll wear those crowns forever. I think He'll reward them to us, but I don't think there'll be any crowns worn there unless he wears one all the time. I want to ask you, will you have a crown to cast at the feet of the Savior? That's what our life is for, to live and to please the Lord, to spend our life that we might have a crown to lay back down at the feet of the worthy Lamb of God. You say, I can't win souls. I, I can't speak to people. I'm not bold enough. You know, I don't know what to do. I can't do it. And you, if you say those things or even think them, you are right. You know that. You are right. We can't do it. We can't do it on, in our own and by ourselves. But if you say, I won't do it, well, that's a whole different matter, isn't it? That's a whole different story. And there will be a day when you wish that you would have. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, it says, And now little children abide in him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Sir Walter Raleigh, some of you maybe know something about him in history. He was a great, great Englishman, uh, an explorer and a writer and did so many things. He was a Christian. And he was meeting with Queen Elizabeth years and years and years ago and she was setting him forth on a great mission of exploration and conquest for the empire. Britain was one of the greatest nations of the world at that time. And she said this to him. She said, Sir, go and make my business your business. And when you return again, I'll make your business my business. That's the way it's going to be someday. If we're willing to make the Lord's business our business now, then He's promised He'll make our business His business. He said if we'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, He'll add all those other things necessary and needful to our lives as we need them. In John chapter 12, verse 26, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Him will my Father honor. Choice is ours. And I'm thankful that we have that choice. And we want to make the choice to be involved in the greatest work in all the world, being some of the greatest people the world has ever known, facing the greatest battle that there is to face, but being able to realize the greatest honor that any man could ever experience. And that's to be a part of leading a soul to Jesus Christ.
however that may be. And that's in such a far encompassing way that we can point souls to Jesus Christ. But we want to be involved in that. Let's pray together tonight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Uh, maybe there's somebody here this evening in this service. The Lord's speaking to your heart tonight. You're speaking, the Lord's speaking specifically to you. Maybe as a young man about stepping out and saying, Lord, if you'll use me, I want to put my life in your hands. If I can preach your word, be a pastor, missionary, or an evangelist, Lord, here I am. Send me. Use me today for the glory of God. Maybe someone tonight, God speaking specifically to you in that way. Maybe tonight there's a young lady or maybe a family here. You believe in your heart. Lord, speaking to you about serving Him in some type of full-time Christian ministry. Lord, here we are. Send us. Use us. Whatever pleases you, God, we're willing. Maybe you tonight, sitting in your pew, in your seat, Maybe tonight the Lord would have you just to, to think about that day, that time, that moment when you'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe tonight, tonight, you're not ready to stand before Him. Maybe no sheaves, no souls, I believe within our life is the potential for all of us to be instrumental in pointing souls to Jesus Christ because Christ lives in us. You say, maybe I just haven't let the Lord live through me. But tonight you want to put your life in the Lord's hands. Lord, use me. Use me to influence my neighbor, my family, my friends, people I work with. Lord, the people I meet on a day in and day out basis. Help me. Use me to influence them and point them to Jesus Christ. I want to make wise decisions with my life. I want my life to count. I want it to make a difference. Would you be willing to come tonight and just say by that, Lord, use me. Use me. Maybe you have family members over the holiday seasons. You'll get to see them. and Maybe, maybe you're, uh, you're looking forward to it. And on one hand, you're kind of dreading it a little bit. Why don't you ask the Lord just to help you? Open up doors of opportunity for you to speak of Jesus Christ to them, to share with them somehow what Jesus Christ has done for you. We pray tonight that you would do that. Whatever the need is in your life, maybe you're here this evening and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You'd say, I need to know what it means to be born again. I need to, I need to be saved today. I need to know what it means to have Christ be my personal Savior. Whatever the needs are, make wise choices for Christ. Make wise choices. We're going to pray together and many have come and we're going to stand though in a moment and sing a verse of a hymn. Maybe the Lord's speaking to your heart about coming. We just pray that we'll be obedient to Him. Lord, use me however it is, whatever I can do to pass out a track, invite someone to church, to pray, whatever it is, Lord, use me. We're going to turn to Him. 296. Father, we pray in Jesus' name now that you'll just take this invitation and God, you do with it tonight what you've divinely ordained to do in the lives of these, your people. They're your people. Lord, we know you have a plan for them. God, in their lives are the potential there, God, for reaching many, many souls for Jesus Christ and glorifying you and honoring you, magnifying you. Lord, we pray there'll be souls in heaven that'll be there because these folks make wise choices. And Lord, we pray tonight, God, you'd bless them and give them the courage and faith and, Lord, the strength and boldness in Christ in them, Lord, to be used of you, lead and guide them. And, Lord, we pray you'd help them to grow, set them apart, and put your hand on their lives. Lord, and use them, we pray. We just ask now, God, tonight again, maybe somebody in this service needs to know you as their personal Savior. We pray they'll come. And God, they'll just receive you this evening and magnify you as the Savior. We just pray and thank you now for what you're doing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand again and turn to that page, page 296. And we're going to sing that first verse together. Hymn number 296. Let's sing that first verse. And maybe if you haven't come and need to, you slip right out of your seat and come. Let's sing the first verse.
let's sing verse 2. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Amen. We appreciate everyone being here this evening and just all day long. We've had a good day in the Lord's house and appreciate the message. And just a uh, verse for me is one that I know well, but the Lord again stirred my heart with it. And I hope he has with you too. And I hope he'll just allow him as he's spoken to you to uh, apply it to your heart and your life and just uh, make it a practice in your life. But we appreciate the message, appreciate our pastor uh, faithfully preaching the word but uh, we're going to finish up here we're going to have a business meeting in just a moment so we'll dismiss and uh, we'll gather back together here in just a moment for our, our business meetings we normally have so uh, but uh, we'll finish here right now with a word of prayer so let's just pray together heavenly father we love you again we just thank you for the privilege it is to be able to just be a part of your family lord to be able to know jesus christ the savior and be able to have the uh, opportunity to be a part of your work, Lord. And we pray, again, you would give us a burden for souls, that uh, you would make that a part of our heart and our lives, that we would uh, be focused, and that would be what drives our lives, that we'd serve you and we'd win the loss for you. And uh, we, we ask you for your strength and for your knowledge and for your power and just uh, for you to work through us so that we can accomplish this work you have for us, Lord. We want to see uh, fruit abound, Lord, and we know it's only by your power. And we ask you to help us with that. Help us to be a church if that's what our focus is. That's what we're known for, Lord, to have just a love for the lost. We ask you to continue to bless our uh, time we spend together and just help us to be uh, the servants that you'd call us to be, Lord. But we love you. We thank you for all you do. It's in the precious name of Jesus we 